Hey guys, what's going on? Um, I apologize. It's been uh, it's been a minute. Uh, before we get into that, this video is gonna be about the USB-C classification system. If you're just here for that, there will be a time code down below. But quick channel update first. So um, this is the P3 Performance Channel, and I haven't been here in like two years. Um, I apologize. I just kind of abandoned the channel with no information. I'm gonna bring certain content back, but. Um, let's make an explanation really, really quickly. So first of all, uh, the name of the channel has actually changed. You might have noticed we're now P3 Performance. We used to be P3 Tactical. That is because actually the Instagram page that I run as my personal uh, page um, was actually uh, zucked on Instagram. It got deleted, and so I had to come back under a different name, and I updated the YouTube channel as well. Since I left this channel two years ago, uh, where have I been? Well, first of all, I've been trying to get better at shooting and really focusing on getting better at shooting and getting education in that space, which I think to a certain extent I've been able to do. And I've been making content like this on another channel um, about how to get faster at splits and gear reviews and all kinds of good all stuff. Right. And uh, that's because I started a, a training company. Or, or rather, I took over a training company. I joined and then I took over a training company, which is now mine. It's called SpecTrain. You can find us at SpecTrain.us. And uh, we have courses this year all across the country. So if you want to get better uh, at shooting, check that out. Uh, so along with that is the SpecTrain YouTube channel, which is a part of that SpecTrain um, company. And that's where I post most of my content over there now. Somehow, even though um, the content over here is way better than the content over here has ever been, uh, we still have less subscribers in this channel than we do here. So if you guys are on the P3 channel and want to catch up on all the latest and greatest content and learn how to get better as a shooter, uh, please head over to Spec Train and subscribe there. I think you will not regret it. We have a lot of cool stuff over here um, about gear, about training tips, ex which is experts for excerpts from classes as well as videos of the one you just saw on splits. We also have the Speed Up and Get Your Hits podcast. So what am I doing over here on the P3 channel? Uh, well... There is sometimes things, honestly, that are just on my mind that I want to talk about, about shooting, about the shooting industry, about training, about competition shooting, whatever it is, um, that I want to talk about, but it isn't necessarily maybe worth a highly edited, you know, high, high production value video, or even a worth a full podcast with my friends. So what I'm going to be doing over here, some, is honestly just giving you guys some rant time. There's going to be no edits to these whatsoever. I don't have time to edit more content, but I'm just going to sit down, talk about some things, and then I'm going to press upload, and if some of you guys get some value out of it, that's great. Um, but if not, it'll be an opportunity for me to get some stuff off my chest. So I want to talk about the USB-C classification system. Why do I want to talk about that? Well, uh, there's a lot of uh, drama <laughs> around it, right? There's a lot of people that think the classification system does or does not work. We shouldn't even have one. Um, so on and so forth. A lot of questions about it. And there's also a lot of people that are just like pursuing a certain classification super hardcore. So I just want to give a brief explanation about it and how it works. And also I answer the question, does it even work, right? So first of all, who am I to answer this question? Well, I do happen to be a grandmaster. Uh, on the top 20 list, I've kind of figured out the classification system, if you will. So I have some expertise there. I started shooting the USB-C, though, not very long ago, right? So I shot two matches back in 2018 um, and figured out that I didn't even have gear that was, like, legal, actually, in carry optics. Some local matches let me shoot, which is very nice. Um, but I didn't even have legal gear. So I took a year off, came back in July of 2019. Obviously, I had a lot to learn. My, my beginning scores were not very good, right? And part of that is classification pressure. We all experience that up front. By about a month in, though, uh, here I was shooting my first master class scores, and I made master class off of this score right here um, in the first week of January. Um, off of this score right here, I actually made master class, uh, or maybe it was second week of January, off of, probably the second week of January, off of these. So just under six months, um, I went from unclassified to master class in USPSA, and I had to learn some things and figure some things out to do that. Um, and of course, now I'm a grandmaster, so I've had to learn even more and start actually learning how to shoot some actual good scores on classifiers and so forth. So I want to talk a little bit about that. First of all, let me answer this question. This, is, this comes up all the time, right? Um, does the classification system actually work? Because people have problems with it. Uh, as an example, um, this is a pretty standard classifier. This is the classic El Presidente, right? And people would say, hey, this does not really represent the kind of shooting that we do 
in USPSA, right? Because it's just standing in a box. It has this like facing uprange start, which you don't see a whole lot in USPSA. And so it'll, how does that actually represent the sport? And, and of course we do have some better ones now that are coming out that actually look kind of like a stage, right? Uh, why can't we have classifiers that represent the sport better? Well, it, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, if you have a full stage that requires, you know, 15 targets and lots of walls and props and so on and so forth, it basically destroys competitive equity because there's no way you can set up those stages across the country and have them be identical to the inch. We already have issues with some clubs not being precise enough in the way that they are setting up their classifiers. And so if we, the more complex and the more involved we make the stages, the worse that problem is going to be. There's simply no way around it. So this kind of thing, I think, is a great step um, on, on the part of USPSA to start trying to make some of these things better, but they still don't necessarily, quote-unquote, represent the sport. It's interesting, then, that when you look at major match scores, the results are pretty well stratified classification. So when you look at the top, a like Grandmaster almost always wins every single major match, and it's G, 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 and you'll see maybe an M in there somewhere, and then some more Gs, and you'll see another M and some more Gs, and then you'll see M, G, G, M, 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 G, 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 A, M, 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 right? And you'll there's there's anomalies. There's always going to be anomalies. There's always going to be somebody that's classified lower that had a great match. There's always going to be plenty of guys that are classified pretty high that had a terrible match. But for the most part, the results are strata stratified by classification couple examples for you. Here is a couple of the uh, major matches that I have shot most recently. This one is uh, North Carolina sections. This is kind of the North Carolina State Championship. I didn't do as well as I wanted. I had a couple bad rounds that uh, hurt me a little bit there. But what you'll see here in the results, again, Grand Masters all the way down to the sixth place. Then we have Tanner Wright. You're going to see him placing much higher um, than most masters at uh, at nationals. We're gonna look at that here in a second. Great young shooter, just hasn't made GM yet, but uh, I think he will very shortly. Okay, a couple more Gs, another M. Here's an anomaly, right? We have a B class shooter already. That's pretty weird. Um, I have a, I don't know what happened there. I don't have an explanation. I don't know who this person is, but we have a B. Then we start seeing a couple A's, some more M's, some more A's, some more M's, a bunch of A's. Right? You get to the point where it's mostly A's here for a while. We start seeing some Bs, 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 A, A, B, 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 mostly Bs for a while. We start seeing our first C, right? Mostly Bs for a long way. An unclassified shooter, here's another C. You eventually get to the point where it's mostly Cs, and then eventually get to the point where it's mostly Cs and Ds and Us. And once you get down to the very bottom, um, there's a bunch of unclassified shooters, Ds, and folks that maybe didn't finish the match, you know, the bottom three here. But down here, it's mostly, you know, Us, Cs, and, and maybe a B or two that had some issues, right? So... The results are pretty well stratified. One more example, we'll look at um, nationals, Carapace nationals. Uh, of course, we have G's at the top. Now, this is extremely, this is not, I'm sorry, let me back up. This is not unusual to see at nationals. It's unusual to see at a lot of others. But what we see at nationals is shooters that are very, very good and are even grandmasters in other divisions come and shoot nationals as another chance to try to win or have a good match placement on their record. And so you have someone that doesn't normally shoot carry optics, might be unclassified in carry optics, but is a great shooter in other divisions, come over and shoot a nationals like this. And of course, they're going to place pretty, pretty well, uh, even though they have that U next to their name, right? So that doesn't really count. Other than that, we go all the way down to number 20 before we see our first M. The top 20s are essentially all Grandmaster, right? And guess who it is again? Tanner Wright, the number one uh, master from North Carolina section as well. Again, and not really a G, right? So we could really say your first M is all the way down at 25. Oh, by the way, 25 is also a Grandmaster. <laughs> 25 is also a Grandmaster, probably the best PCC shooter of all time. He's the only person to ever win the PCC National Championship, so he is the best PCC shooter. Um, but you know, probably one of the best rifle shooters of all time as well, right? More Gs. Um, point being, there's a lot of Gs at the top of the ranks in, in carry optics, right? Then we start seeing some more M's in here. Uh, again, you're going to see a lot of anomalies. There's an A shooter that had a great match. Again, it happens. You're going to see some more U's. This is, again, that Mike Stieglander, you know, obviously a great shooter and a grandmaster as well, just not classified in in carry optics, so to speak. So that doesn't really count. Again, 
Start seeing some M's. Eventually, we're going to get to the point where it's mostly M's, right? Then we'll start seeing some A's. Eventually, we're going to get to the point where it's probably mostly A's. Well, now we're going to start seeing some B's and the occasional anomaly C, right? And eventually, if we keep going all the way down to the bottom, uh, you know, you might eventually start seeing like board members and stuff down here, right? So that's kind of how the results stratify um, according to class. And of course, we just see mostly C's. There's like, there's nothing going to be that many like D class shooters at nationals, right? So towards the bottom is where all the C's are pretty much clustered. So all that to say, it seems like the classification system is actually a pretty decent indicator of how a shooter is going to do at a major match, according to the results. So therefore, I think it's pretty fair to say that the classification system does work. So how does it work? How is shooting a stage like this an indication of how you're going to do at a USA match? To me, it's very simple, right? Believe it or not, even though we like to do lots of fancy movement and crazy stuff on big stages, believe it or not, being fast and accurate on target is is really freaking important. It's really important. Just being able to draw the gun, the gun handling skills, getting your sights on target, and shooting alphas really fast is what wins matches. Yes, the movement stuff's important, right? The movement is important, especially at the higher levels, but really, in competition at the high levels... Man, still being fast and accurate on target is really important. And the classif classifier stages, a lot of them do a pretty good job of testing whether or not you're fast and accurate, whether or not you can shoot alphas in a hurry. Here's another interesting thing about classifiers. A lot of people struggle with classifier stages because of the mental pressure there. When you're trying to make GM or make whatever the level is, folks have troubles with that because, man, there's that pressure and you only get one stage. Right, and it's a low point value stage, which means that you know there's there's a big percentage swing that happens if you're familiar with the hit factor math. Uh, if you just make small mistakes, so what you have to do to be good at shooting classifiers is under pressure, ignore how fast you think you have to go, shoot your your process right, and just trust the results will be there, and you have to shoot those very consistently to move up. That, again, is a great skill to have when it comes to major match pressure and performance. So in a lot of ways, the classifiers do pretty well. Now, why do I think the classifier system is important? Ipsic, after all, doesn't have a classifier system, right? And so people will say, well, why do we have a classifier system? I actually love the classification system, and here's why. One of my primary goals... If I was in charge of USPSA, one of the things I love about the sport, but one of the things I would want to foster if I was ever on the board or anything like that, it is very simply this. I want people to get better at shooting. I love the skill challenge that competition is. I love how it, how it inspires people to put in work and get better. That's what an athletic performance competition is supposed to do, whether it's football or the olympics or whatever sport or competition you're involved in it's supposed to be about getting better now like golf as an example if you want to get on the pga you're gonna to have to be pretty good but there's a lot of people that go out and play golf every single weekend for 20 years and have no real interest in getting better and you say of course we want to get better okay maybe they intellectually desire to get better but they don't desire it enough for it to actually impact their actions. They're not going out and taking lessons. They're not going out and really practicing every day. They're not actually putting the work in that's required to get better. They're not paying attention to, 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 to fitness and nutrition. They're not taking it seriously, right? And so in my mind, if you're not taking it seriously, you don't really want to get better, or at least you don't want to get better enough to prioritize it over the other things. So I'm okay with those folks having a place in the sport that we have and as a matter of fact we kind of have to have those folks because it's a volunteer driven sport right so we have to have those folks that just shoot it for fun but i also want to i want to foster and encourage the folks that have the potential to really grow and get better and i want to encourage them along the way to do that how can we do that well one of the ways we do that is with the classifier system i don't want it to be where you know you start off at the bottom or you're, you're placing 50% of the match winner, right? 
and you don't basically get any rewards. There's no positive reinforcement. There's no feedback that you're doing well until you win your first match. That That is going to cause a lot of people to burn out and just not make it, right? Think about martial arts as an example, right? It takes a lot of years to get that black belt to actually be good at martial arts. But why do people stick with it? Well, some of them don't stick with it, but those that do, one of the things that drives them is getting that next belt. Is getting your blue belt in jiu-jitsu mean you're some kind of fantastic world-class martial artist? Absolutely not, right? But what does it mean? It means you've put the work in, you've learned, and you know some stuff, by the way, at blue belt level, that will allow you to kick some tail <laughs> in the real world, like just to be honest, right? So even though you're not actually good, you're a lot better than anyone who's not you, right? And so that's kind of what the classification system is about. It's about positive reinforcement, about letting people know where you stack up. And I think that's absolutely great. Another reason it's really great is at the local match level, it gives you some feedback about where you stand in match results. If you just go to your local match, and you shoot, and you win that match, you might think, wow, that means I'm really, really good. And if you win that match every time, every month, every week, whatever it is, you might start thinking, man, I'm a national level talent. What the classification system allows you to do is look and see, hmm, who's here though? <laughs> is anybody here actually any good? Interesting question. If it's all in C, C and D class shooters, probably not, right? Probably not. So it lets you know where you actually stack up and how good other shooters in your area roughly might be. So that's pretty cool. If you don't know how the classification system works, it's pretty simple. There's this deal right here. So in other words, Grandmaster is supposed to be the top 5%, Masters 85 to 95, and so on. What do these numbers actually mean, though? Well, you come down and you shoot classifiers. And there is a number called high hit factor that is set for a stage. So here's 1808 as an example. If I grab the classification calculator and I look at carry optics and I look at 1808 in this handy classification calculator and I hit calculate, I didn't put all the information in. The point being, it's going to give me a number. Here's GM at 8.2 is the minimum hit factor. But there's also a number called the high hit factor. Maybe it's 8.9 as an example. And 8.9 is 100% on this classifier we're looking at right here, 100%. Where does 100% come from? 100% of what? Well, they run this at nationals is the way it's typically done. They'll put a stage at nationals and they'll have everyone, the best shooters in the world, shoot that stage. They take the top 10 runs on it and they average that out to say, man, on average, what is the best shooters in the world gonna shoot on this stage? And that, that's 100%, that's your high hit factor for that stage. So in order to be GM, you essentially have to average within 5% of the best shooters in the world on your classifier stages, right? And of course, the percentages work all the way down. When you first start, your first very first classification is simply an average of your first four scores. After, you sh after that, once you shoot eight, it's an average of the best six out of your last eight. So if you look at my current classifiers that are counting, Here's 97%. My match placement, major match placements count as classifiers as well a lot of times um, at the Carolina Classic. That's actually one of my lower scores, so it doesn't count because that's that's two of my worst last eight that can actually count, right? That's why it has this F flag next to it. So the hundreds and the 98s do count because those are some of my better ones. So it actually gives you a couple give me's there. Why is that? Well, no one's a perfect 100% of the time. But they want folks to be consistent. Here's something to think about, though. How does this actually work, right? We actually know now. Here's a chart from Competition, sh competition Shooting Analytics on Instagram uh, showing for the various divisions how well the classification system works. In other words, what we see here is that in open, right, GMs are the top 2.8% right now. In carry optics, GMs are the top 1.31%. Wait a minute. I thought we were supposed to be the top 5%. No. You have to average within 5% of the best shooters in the world. But saying that puts you in the top 5% of active competitive shooters is completely inaccurate. It's actually way higher than that. 
the amount of shooters that can average within that 5% is typically less than like 3%, you know, two, one, one, two percent of, of, of shooters, right? 1.3 for carry optics, 2.8 for, for open and so on. Overall, I asked the question and the answer is it's the top 1.8% of active shooters at the time that these numbers were actually run. So you can see in these, in this bar graph, here's all the shooters. And then up at the top, this kind of dark red bar represents who the GMs are. So it's, it's a very small and, and frankly elite club if you can make it into the GM group. So it is something that's pretty difficult to get into. Why is it so difficult to make GM? Are the scores that crazy? It's actually not really about that. It's not about that. Let me give you an example. If we go back to my classifier record, you'll remember that I made, so I started, <laughs> my first classifier was a 16%. <laughs> that's really bad, if you don't know. That's really bad. 52, 47, so on and so forth. I shot my first master class within about a month of, of that January date at 87%. That doesn't mean I was bad, done sucking yet. I still was going to suck, and I still do suck sometimes at some to this day. However, I shot my first 100% score um, right after making master class, um, within a month making master class. So here I am seven months into the sport, and I shoot my first 100% score. That means I have the skills. I'm capable of shooting 100%. As a matter of fact, uh, three months later, I shoot another 100%, right? So I had the skills at that point. I was fast enough. I had the ability to get points. But you'll notice I'm not very consistent. There's a lot of very low scores that are peppered in here with these hundreds. Here's why it's so hard to make GM. Let's say you're not making GM. Let's say you're trying to make a master class. Master class is anything over 85%. So you'll notice here are six scores that are averaged out to give me 85%. I have 100 in here out of six scores. That bumps my score up, my average up significantly, so significantly, in fact, it allows me to have a 65. So I can miss the mark by 20% and still make and still make master class. I can have a 65% score. Why? Because I can also shoot a 100% score. So the difference in my mind between master and grandmaster is really not skill so much. It's not that to make grandmaster, you have to have some crazy, 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 crazy high level of skill. So you have to be super, super consistent. Here's what I mean. Let's start tweaking these scores. Let's say I throw a 90 and a 91 and a 97 and a 95 in here. And I also have a 92, so we'll throw another 98. You'll notice that I barely make GM with this run. This is with every single one of my scores within 10%, right? If I bump this down to a 97, yeah, actually I do, right? 96, I don't make it. Not, that may seem like a, an extreme number, but I know guys sitting at that 94.83% mark. As a matter of fact, if we go back to the top 20 list, and we look at the top of M class right now, here's guys at 94%, <laughs> right? So the, the top six guys are all over 94% and are struggling to make it that last little bit. Here's my buddy Nick Young right here. He's, he's gonna be making it any day, right? But there's a lot of guys that are really, really close to that 95% mark, but they're just having troubles bumping over. Why is that? Because of how consistent this is. So imagine I have, as an example, 185 in here. Now, even if I bump, let's say, this one up to a 97, I'm still only at 94. So here I have 91, 97, 100, 97, 95. This guy is a good shooter, but he has one score at 85%. Keep in mind, when I was trying to make master class, I was really excited about the 85. There's a good, there's a master class score. That's a good score. It's killing me I'm trying to make GM. So what do you have to do to make GM? Here's the way that I normally see it kind of running, right? You, most guys, the easiest way to make GM is to have 300% counting. If you have 300s counting, your remaining three still have to average over 90%. 
in the top 10%, right? I still have to average over 90. Why is it? Why, why, why do I have to shoot 300s and then shoot three more that still average over 90 to make GM? That seems kind of crazy. The reason is very simple. Because it's impossible to shoot a 110. You remember when we were trying to make master that I could shoot 100, even though the, the top threshold for master is 95, I could shoot that 100, right? You can't do that when you're making GM. 100% is the ceiling, right? So not only is the gap smaller, remember that for the other classify classifications, this is a 10% gap, 10% gap, 15% gap, 20% gap. It keeps getting bigger as you go down. So not only is it, are we changing from a 10% gap to a 5% gap, but there's now a hard ceiling. You cannot go over 100%, which forces you to be very, very consistently good. You have to shoot basically 300s, and you still have to average over 100% to just barely make it in GM. So that's why I think it's so difficult to make it into GM. And this is also why the classification system works. What's the difference between a master class shooter in their match results and a grandmaster in their match results? It's not, again, the grandmaster is significantly better than the master. It's not, it's not like if you look at grandmasters across the board, their draws are faster than master class dudes. My draw was great the whole time, right? As a matter of fact, my draw is probably a little sloppier now than it was back when I was master class. It's not about that. What you have to learn to be a grandmaster and to place like a grandmaster is consistent execution. This is the conclusion I'm coming to. This is when I train with guys, by the way, like Eric Grafell and Ben Steger and JJ Rakaza. I've trained with all of these guys. This is the message. If you want to be a world champ, you want to be a national champ, you've got to be consistent. You don't have to be the best. You have to be the most consistent. Ben Steger won nationals without winning a single stage. That's crazy, but he was just consistently good. He was consistently good. And that's what's really required to be a grandmaster. So that is, this is another example of why I think the classification system works. I don't know if this was intentional. I don't know if they, they realized it was going to work exactly like this or not. But it does, right? It does. And I think this is exactly the way that it should be. So anyway, guys, hopefully that may give you some perspective on the classifier system and why it works and why I think it's important. The stages themselves aren't that important as long as they require you to be fast and accurate and to do so consistently under pressure. <laughs> That's what's important. And I think the classifier stages do that pretty darn well. So there's my thoughts that I wanted to get off my chest on the on the classification system. Maybe some of you guys found that interesting. If so, do me a favor, head over to the Spec Train channel and subscribe. There's a lot better edited and, and better produced content going on uh, over there that I think will help you guys get better and will help you learn how to be a grandmaster if you want to do that someday. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.